Good morning. I'm very honored to be here and that Mike asked me to speak to you this morning while he's off in Hawaii at the beach. <laughs> Didn't take us with us, that's okay. I want to start off with our core value. CSL has seven core values that we hold near and dear in it. It's the underpinnings of everything that we do and teach here. And today's core value is abundance. And when we talk about abundance, we talk about more than just money and material possessions. It's a more of a way of living, a way of realizing all the things that are always provided to us. And I think that nature is a really good example of abundance. If you look around, there's abundance of trees, and there's abundance of leaves, and there's abundance of air, and there's abundance of water. And when we live from a place where we feel truly abundant, even when our outside circumstances or our, our financial institutions or what have you don't look like what we'd like them to, we can look past that to look at everything that we have that life has to offer. So the title of my talk is, The Bad News is the Good News. And as you might expect, I'm going to tell you why. But first, I want to read something to you. Any skilled sailor will tell you that the sea is unpredictable. Sometimes the water is flat and serene, and you can see clearly for miles and miles in all directions. It's beautiful, comforting, and you're excited and hopeful about what's on the horizon. Undulating ripples of various heights always come and go. Your job is to flow with them until they level out again. But sometimes, massive storms begin forming in the distance with gale force winds and gigantic swells. Some you can see coming, and there's time to batten down the hatches and brace yourself. Others take you completely by surprise, bearing down before you can suck in a big gulp of air and latch on to something. No life vest is anywhere within reach. The boat capsizes and you're thrown overboard, violently thrashed about. Your internal compass is so jostled, it's unable to discern north, nor south, nor east, nor west, much less the surface. After what seems like an eternity, the winds die down, the sea begins to calm, and there's a sliver of sunshine peeking through an opening in the clouds. A shard from the wreckage innocently floats by as if nothing happened. You latch on, clinging to it for dear life. As the cerebral fog begins to lift and the briny water trickles from every orifice above your shoulders, you realize you're alive. Barely, battered and bruised, but alive. Perhaps a rescue vessel will be along at any minute. But despite this reprieve, you just want to let go, sink beneath the surface into the abyss, and move on. This seems to be the story of my life, the storms becoming stronger, more ferocious, and increasingly insurmountable as the years pass. Death has got to be better than this. Just let go. This time, I just want to let go. This is the introduction to my upcoming book. So how did I get there? In February of last year, our beloved dog Rocco drowned the kid's first pet. And due to the circumstances of his transition and his burial, they, re they were not there for either one and received no closure. So as a parent, you're always, of course, worried about their, their emotional and mental state when something like that happens because they're not used to death like we are as adults. Five months later, the love of my life 
the first man, 11 years post-divorce, with whom I had gone all in, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, left. Out of the blue, essentially with no word at all. I had been hit by the proverbial Mack truck at 100 miles an hour, and I never saw it coming. For months, I tried to sustain a brave front, telling everybody what a good person he is and that he had been hurt in other relationships before and that this highway accident was probably the best that he could do. But inside, I felt like I had failed. And I gave the kids the same placebo too. I figured, why let them get hit by the same Mack truck? They're innocent bystanders and this wasn't their accident. But inside, I felt like I had, <clears throat> I had led them to my morgue of failure as well. Ten days later, my youngest son was scheduled to have outpatient surgery. And at the last minute, his dad, my co-parent, decided not to show up. Again, using his anger at me from the divorce as the underlying reason for his impending absence again. Five days after that, I was scheduled to give the talk here at CSL. It was a Wednesday night. We used to call it Wednesday Night Wisdom then. And the title of my talk was, You Just Have to Believe in Yourself Because You Are Far More Than You Know. Well, I gave the talk, and it went well. But behind my smile, I was standing in the quicksand of stress, hurt, and anger over the past few weeks' events. The irony of the timing was not lost on me. Now, as most of you know, I'm employed, uh, self-employed as a freelance writer. And last year, assignments weren't coming in as quickly and all of that, and finances were really tight. But the mortgage company wants their money. And soon they started sending letters. And soon those letters had their corporate attorneys, John Hancock, at the bottom. Around that same time, my oldest child was right in the beginning of the college search. And it all of a sudden struck me, just like everyone says, in a blink of an eye, that 17 plus years had flown by. And he was going to be leaving me. His brother soon to follow. The emptiness grieving had begun. And if that wasn't enough, there was weeks and weeks of research, research and bids and contractors coming over for a variety of home improvement projects that needed to be done before the winter sent in. And my menopausal power surges were making me literally a hot mess. And there was all this other stuff, regular life stuff and going on, and I'm sure there are other things that I forgot about, or perhaps I blocked some of them out. In December, the dam holding all of my emotions didn't just break, it violently imploded. A thousand sticks of dynamite couldn't have done a more thorough job. Why, God, why? I do my best to be a good person. I pray. I meditate. I read spiritual books. I seek the wisdom of others. I practice forgiveness. I share in my abundance. I try so hard. And I follow and wholeheartedly believe in the spiritual principles that they teach here at CSL, that we are spiritual beings having a human experience and we have all the tools we need to overcome any obstacle or challenge and that we are divinely guided in every way. And I'd seen and experienced all of that in the life, my life and the lives of others for years. So it was nothing new. Yet still I cried out, why is all of this happening to me? At the same time, I was beating myself up with, 
What is your deal, Lisa? Your house didn't get blown away in a tornado. No one in your family got a terminal medical diagnosis. There are other people who have lost spouses of 30, 40, 50 years, and they've been able to move on with their life. All of those things are horrible. But you have food, clothing, transportation, family and friends that love you. So why can't you pull it together? In my family of origin, the motto was, what happens in the house stays in the house. And showing our emotions was highly uh, discouraged. I'd say almost bordering on for, for, uh, forbidden. Now, there's no blame there, but it's no wonder I never learned how to deal with adversity. By now, I really knew what it meant when people talk about the dark night of the soul. The depression was utterly overwhelming. I wasn't sleeping. I wasn't eating. I lost 20 pounds. I was crying all the time, could barely hold it together some days, more than a few minutes at a time. And I was trying really hard not to let the kids see any of it. Soon, my inner dialogue went something like this. You can't do anything right. Why did you think a man would stick around to love you? You're a horrible mother. You're not smart enough. This all hurts too much to get out of it this time. So why don't you just be done with it? Because you're not serving any purpose here anyway. Oddly enough, thankfully, there was one small sliver of light. It was gray, but it was there nonetheless. What about my kids? I had seen what happens when people depart here of their own volition, what it does to the people they left behind, and I just knew I couldn't do that to them. Well, great. So now that little box that I already felt like I was in suddenly got a lot smaller and a lot tighter, and I had no idea what to do. I was completely immobile, paralyzed by fear, and hopeless. Now, it may be a bit presumptuous of me, but you might be thinking right now, good grief, I feel worse than when I walked in here this morning. <laughs> she said she had some good news, so when is she gonna get to that? <laughs> Sorry, but you haven't been listening. And in your defense, I wasn't either at first. All of that, every tear, every heartbreaking moment, every fear-induced panic attack, all of it was the good news. I was just too caught up in my humanity to see it. In the book that Kate and uh, Jeannie talked about, Radical Forgiveness by author Colin Tipping, he says that in the world of divine truth, the human experience is meant to be an emotional one. So the extent to which we deny our feelings is the extent to which we deny our purpose for being here. Life is not random. It provides for the purposeful unfoldment of our own divine plan. 
with opportunities to make choices and decisions in every moment guided by our higher self and ego. Situations that appear to be the worst that could actually befall us may hold the key to our healing something deep within us that keeps us from being happy and prevents our growth. If we are to transform anything, we must be able to experience it completely and fully. There is no shortcut. Therefore, we need situations in our lives that allow us to feel victimized so we can transform the energy through radical forgiveness. When my dam shattered to bits, that's when my healing and my transformation began. I believe that the universe was inviting me to surrender. Not like this. But like this. Here are some of the things that I learned, and they're for you too. First, you're going to have to reach out to others for help. Believe it or not, and it may not feel like it, you are not the only person going through what you're going through. Everybody goes through an extremely difficult time in their life, and more than once. It may be in a little different form, but it's no less soul-crushing to them or to you, nonetheless. You might have to go to counseling, or in my case, back to counseling, again. <laughs> when you pray and meditate, you're really going to have to listen to how the universe responds, because the universe is going to respond in whatever way you are reaching out to it. So if you are reaching out from a place of unworthiness, everything in your experience is going to mirror that and speak to that. But it's when you raise your vibration to a higher level of thinking and realizing the spiritual being that you are, that's when you reach your higher level of consciousness. I was forced to be vulnerable and to take a good, hard look at some of my beliefs, not just about things and other people, but about myself and how I was living small to please others and to make them feel comfortable with me. But in the process, I was not living authentically at all. I was the one who had to be completely comfortable with me. Because we're human, we're not perfect. And the more we keep trying to be perfect and to not show others our flaws, the more we're robbing ourselves of living into the authentic life that we were sent here. There's a saying that when something is cracked or broken, that's when the light can come in and that there's beauty in that shattering. That light is an opening for new possibilities and perspectives. And believe it or not, it is where you are more powerful than you have ever been. Those cracks are the beginning of your healing. <laughs> and most of all, I learned, do not give up. Do not give up. If the one power and presence in the universe that created everyone and everything and sent you all your dreams and desires and everything that you want for your life, who are you or me to try and give that back? without trying to live into the higher being that you were born to be. Now, I conceptually knew all of that at the time all of this was going on, but for some reason, I just could not grasp onto any of that. But those are the times when I and you have yet another opportunity to practice your spiritual practice. <clears throat> 
I've heard it described as dipping into your escrow or your savings account, where you have resources set aside for when things happen. Get a flat tire, chip a tooth, the small setbacks in life. And those same resources are there for the bigger things. You fall down the stairs, hot water heater goes out, tree falls on the roof. Those are the bigger things that happen in our human experience. Author Daniel Laporte once wrote that we don't need to forgive until we need to forgive. And we don't need nerves of steel until we need nerves of steel. And we don't need, she says, to call upon our reserves of compassion or fortitude or faith until we've used up everything else. And this is why we maintain our spiritual practice. Because those days are going to come when you're going to have to make a withdrawal. But that bank is always there and always open. It's God, spirit, whatever you call your guiding presence. And it never leaves us. So back to my story. So what were the lessons and blessings that I learned in each of those events? In the world of divine truth, death is an illusion. Our dog Rocco is still here. He was joy and unconditional love in every way, shape, and form, and that's a gift that we'll always have for him, even if he's not here in physical form. In the world of divine truth, the abrupt end to my relationship revealed an underlying belief I didn't know that I had was that men leave. Daddy was the first. And I see why there were others in between. But I wasn't giving myself credit for the 10-year relationship and marriage that I did have and the other relationships before and after that just ran their natural course. In the world of divine truth, my frustration over my ex-husband's behavior led to another belief that it, life, is all up to me. I'm out here all by myself, and I can't trust anybody. But the thing is, God never leaves you. In the world of divine truth, a big part of the financial strain I underwent pointed to things that I had heard in my family of origin and that we hear in society all the time, which is that you're not good enough just the way you are. So you're not worth it, and you're not going to be successful. But that would be totally glossing over that in 53 years of life, I've had a lot of successes, financial and otherwise, including a 20-year career as a freelance writer that I absolutely adore. In the world of divine truth, my anguish over my sons, I call them my two hearts, beating on the outside of my body, them getting ready to leave the nest, that was a reminder that they were sent here for their own purposes. My only job is to let them soar. Wherever they go, whatever they do, whatever choices they make, I'm still a good mother. Now, don't get me wrong. This particular part of my spiritual journey was not easy. It's not like I had an Oprah aha moment and everything's been honky-dory. At times, it has been slow, excruciating, and has had all the self-defeating properties of two steps forward and four steps back. But it is helping me build a new foundation, one of which I can rise above the human experience and take in everything that's happening. Music? Not yet. <laughs> 
and better learn to live in the world of divine truth, the only right and true belief system, that my very existence is love and abundance, and that I am never and have never been separate from God. And neither are you, because we are all one. Evidence of this divine truth appeared immediately at the onset of my black hole breakdown when scores of people, friends and family, from near and from far, some I knew really, really well, some I didn't know very well at all, and some who wear fabulous shoes, (laughs) gently circled the wagons, loved me up, and showed up for me in ways I couldn't possibly have imagined. You see, my light hadn't been dimmed at all. It's just that I had allowed the dark clouds of life that flowed in now again to hang out much longer than they were here to serve me and to lead me to my higher consciousness and greater good. So one last piece of good news. Those clouds are going to come again, some potentially yanking the rug right out from under me, leaving me sprawled on the floor, looking up and saying, what happened? But it's from that vantage point that I can look up in the world of divine truth, firmly rooted in that, surrender to what is, and realize that those things are not happening to me, they are happening for me. And so ends the lesson. Giving you an affirmation card. Did I lose my card? Oh, here it is. I got it. This is what we want you to take with you. Refer to it anytime that you feel that you need it. It's up on the wall, and if you'll say it with me. In the world of the dying truth, the bad news is the good news. Let's pray. loving presence, we are so grateful to have this opportunity to yet again come together in spiritual community, to love each other, to support each other, to remind each other of the real truth, the only right and true belief system, that we are spiritual beings having a human experience, and that what we see with our eyes is just an illusion. We know that we can go inside and touch spirit at any time, anywhere, reach into that bank of our reserves and live into the beautiful spiritual beings we were born to be. And knowing that all is always in divine order and we we are divinely guided in every thought, word, and action in every moment, our only job is to stay plugged into that powerful source and know that we are never alone, we are never separate from God, we are always connected, and all is always well. And so it is. <laughs>